Hey, listeners, we've been tackling this post row reality by zooming in on stories from abortion providers and activists all around the country. If you've appreciated this season and want to dive even deeper into the history and future of abortion access in this country, go check out Katie Couric's special series, Abortion, The Body Politic. It's a nuanced exploration of the forces that have politicized this deeply personal choice and the people on the front lines of the fight for reproductive rights. Listen to Abortion, The Body Politic, wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Kate Kelly. And I'm Jamia Wilson. And this is Ordinary Equality. This is something central to a woman's life, to her dignity. It's a decision that she must make for herself. From Kansas, Kentucky, and North Carolina, dedicated women marched. Abortion is fast becoming the new political fault line. Alabama's governor has signed the nation's strictest abortion ban into law. The Human Life Protection Act outlaws the procedure, except when the mother's life is at risk. This bill is not about pro-life or the right to life. This bill is about control. We will not go back. We will not go back. And we, the people of the United States of America, documented or undocumented, are having abortions, legal or not. This court will never stop us. Okay, so we're four episodes in, and we've recorded the first episode of this season the day after Roe fell, which seems like a lifetime ago, but also like it happened yesterday. Uh, And so now we're in this upside down world. Uh, How are you feeling? It's sad to be where we are because... Every day, it feels like a little bit of a game of whack-a-mole. We get one step forward, two steps back. There's a state that's able to beat back a ban, and then we find out about another state that's advancing something terrible or that is doubling down on criminalizing providers or criminalizing people who are seeking care. So I think that just the, the trauma of the back and forth, the chaos... The shock and awe about it all is a lot. And I know that it's designed to be that way. And uh, yet the feeling of inspiration that our community is strong and committed and determined and will not accept this terrible, terrible ban, um, that's what fuels me. Yeah. And it feels like to me post row is kind of gonna be that duality that you're talking about fighting when it feels like you've already lost uh balancing hope and grief um and something i've been thinking about a lot is this cornell west quote that i put in my twitter bio uh which is i cannot be an optimist but i am a prisoner of hope and i think that kind of dichotomy is a space that today's guest, who we'll be talking with, knows very, very intimately. I am Jasmine Chan. I am a first-year medical resident for family medicine. Here are a few things about Jasmine. Jasmine is from Texas, and like most Texans that you talk to, she loves the Lone Star State. I have a soft spot in my heart for Texas. Texas is where my family started, and... It's where I was raised for 27 years. As a first year resident, Jasmine has graduated from medical school and she's now a doctor in training and she's training for a very specific job. My only goal in my career at this point is to be an abortion provider. So here's the deal. Jasmine is a Texas loving future abortion provider. But to make that a reality, to get the training she needs to someday provide abortions in Texas, Jasmine actually has to leave because she can't get the proper training in her own state. Jasmine's story has a bunch of dualities. I think one that really stuck with me is that she grew up in Dallas and Houston, two of the state's biggest cities. They're diverse, they're metropolitan, 
In 2012, when Jasmine was finishing high school, Dallas had four abortion clinics and Houston had eight. And honestly, it was just kind of something that I took for granted that I had access to a very close Planned Parenthood. I know people in college who had abortions, but it just seemed so easy back then. Then Jasmine went to medical school outside the big city. I moved from Dallas and Houston, from some of the biggest metropolitan areas in the nation to West Texas, which is a lot more rural. I think the closest major cities are about 250 to 300 miles away. So when I started med school, I knew that I was moving to a place where my closest abortion would be five and a half hours. And that would be the first time in my life that I would be disenfranchised to that degree. Suddenly, Jasmine found herself in what she calls an abortion desert. She knew she wanted to be an OBGYN. She'd volunteered at health clinics throughout college and loved working with women. At this point, she really wasn't thinking about abortion as something that would be her full-time career. Yes, she was interested in it. But I had never met an abortion provider because they are so rare in Texas. Okay, so you might be thinking, wait, wasn't abortion so accessible in Texas that Jasmine just took it for granted? Well, in 2012, it was relatively accessible. Texas had 42 abortion clinics, which might seem like a lot, but Texas geographically is huge. And it had over 25 million residents. Clinics were clustered in cities, and lots of people still had to drive hundreds of miles to get to that one provider that serviced their area. Then in 2013, House Bill 2 was introduced, which imposed all kinds of restrictions on these clinics. Over the next three years, Texas gained over a million new people and lost 23 abortion clinics. And to be honest, most people don't meet abortion providers until they themselves need one. So here Jasmine was, just starting med school, a future OBGYN. And she started noticing something about the way her instructors talked about abortion. I know that in my second year of medical school, we had a PowerPoint where we were learning about abortions in the context of a miscarriage. And so they would like lightly use the word abortion, but be very scared of using it because the technical word for a miscarriage is a missed abortion in medicine. But even saying that was kind of hard for our lecturers. And just because I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, um, are the people giving these lectures, are they medical doctors? Are they OBGYNs? Like, who are the people teaching you? Yeah, so in my lectures, most of them were clinicians, doctors. Um, a lot of them were OBGYNs. But in their practice, they don't do elective abortions. But they do do the exact same procedures for miscarriages. What was the energy when they talked about abortion even in, though they talked about it as as miscarriage care, um, it sounded it so sounds to me what you're describing is almost like they like whispered it or something. I mean, I think it was something that they were kind of scared to talk about. Like, I don't believe that all of my lecturers were against choice, but I do believe that they were afraid for not just our reaction but also their colleagues' reaction. So, something that I did hear from a few professors who's talked to me privately about my passions was that while they support me, they can't publicly support me because they need to keep good relations with their coworkers. And I think in Texas in general, people aren't used to talking about it. They don't know how to talk positively about it. And in a lot of ways, it's kind of something that is awkward. And I don't know how to explain it, but and they're not comfortable supporting it and saying like abortion is a miracle abortion is a great thing that we have abortion is healthier like they can't go that far as to say that even like these are doctors doctors talking to future doctors right yeah when i did my ob rotation we did not learn about elective abortions to any degree because they don't exist out there it's not something that we're going to see in training it is something that we do see though because women come in because they get abortions in Colorado, New Mexico, or Dallas, and then they need help afterwards. So I did see post-abortion patients, and it was something that like I needed to know, but it wasn't something that I was formally taught in my lectures. 
We'll be right back after a quick break. Our listeners know that access to abortion and other forms of reproductive care is absolutely essential. We also know that the ongoing attack on this fundamental right is detrimental to so many people in so many ways. Sometimes it feels impossible to figure out what you can do to help. And trust me, I get it. But our sponsor, Act Blue, makes it easy to take action. Trusted by millions of small dollar donors, Act Blue's online fundraising platform is seamless and secure. You can donate directly to reproductive justice groups and abortion funds across the country in just a few clicks. So head to wondermedianetwork.com slash donate and click donate now to find reproductive justice groups that you can support today. That's wondermedianetwork.com slash donate. wondermedianetwork.com slash donate. Okay, so let's go back to West Texas. Jasmine is in med school. She's trying to learn about abortion care. She's discovering that she wants to be a provider. But even though she's seemingly exactly where a person goes to learn how to do abortions, she can barely get her lecturers to even say the word, let alone train her. Yeah, I think this is a gap that a lot of non-doctors don't realize exists and has existed for a while now. Back in 2005, the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology surveyed medical students about their exposure to abortion training. And it was uh, kind of bleak. Nearly a quarter of students said they had no formal education about abortion at all, not even a lecture like the one Jasmine had. And over half the schools reported that their students got zero clinical experience with abortion. It's no surprise then that in 2015, the National Abortion Federation estimated that the number of doctors who actually gave abortions had fallen nearly 40% since 1982. Yeah, I mean, that's a great example of the ripple effect that happens when we cut abortion access. Without doctors and providers who are trained to give abortions, then we can't even open more clinics, even where it's still legal. And a lot of places in the restricting states are going to need care in other places. So they'll have to amp up or build or create or fully staff clinics in receiving states. And if there are no doctors to fill those additional slots in those states, they won't be able to meet the demand. With Roe falling, 26 states are expected to ban or really limit abortion access. So unsurprisingly, that means that nearly half of OBGYN residents already or soon will be training in states where they legally can't get trained on life-saving procedures. Because that's what they are. Life-saving. Yes. And you know what? Jasmine actually got a taste of what medicine post-Roe would look like. Because last year in 2021... Texas passed Senate Bill 8, or SB 8. It banned abortion after six weeks. And it allowed anyone to sue any doctor who performs an abortion. I was near the end of my third year of clinical rotations in medical school. And I didn't actually expect SB 8 to pass at that time. I ended up having to take the, I think, two days off medical school because I was devastated and I also kind of felt directionless because for a few days I felt like my life goals were now like a moot point but then when it actually went into effect on September 1st I was in a room full of OB gyms doing my normal daily work and they were all like surprised and shocked and confused and acting like they couldn't believe that this thing had just happened when we had known that it was coming for six months prior. So that was a really, really hard few weeks for me to realize that after all the work that all the people had put in behind this movement in Texas, the providers who should know the most weren't prepared at all for it to come in September. Suddenly, Jasmine and her peers and her professors were all sitting through legal talks with the university's lawyers 
because doctors are not lawyers. And they don't just magically understand the intricacies of bills written by politicians. OBGYNs were just as confused as everyone else. The first week, every time a patient came in needing some kind of miscarriage support, a lawyer would be called first. And there would be like a 15 minute minimum to like hour delay in their care because the providers were not sure what they were allowed to and what they weren't allowed to do. And sitting in those conversations, there was a lot of speculation about, oh, but this is an exception, but this isn't. And like a lot of it was just wrong and stuff that they'd read from a news article and they hadn't gotten clear instructions from their hospital or their governing bodies beforehand to prepare them for this is what I found out. This sounds like chaos. Yeah, that was like two or three weeks of our practice kind of being thrown upside down. Providers were furious. Even if they themselves never provided abortions or elective abortions, they were upset that their medical judgment was now being impaired by politicians. They were upset that they weren't able to provide care in the way that they were taught in in their scientifically correct way. They couldn't, they felt that they couldn't talk to their patients candidly anymore because they were afraid that they were going to get in trouble and get fined $10,000. Like they were scared to even talk to their patients scientifically. And patients were completely lost. In the panic around SB8, people were told that all abortion clinics had closed. They hadn't, and that abortion was banned in Texas. It wasn't, because abortion was still legal. There's nowhere for patients to go to get good information because they, everybody is just giving their opinion or some version of it, and there was never like a safe place for patients to understand their rights. And also they can't ask their doctors because their doctors are also confused, it sounds like. Yeah. Ooh. It's just, it's just breathtaking to think about what it must be like to just want to do your job and to keep the virtues of the oath, do no harm, And yet you're having to work from a place of fear and understanding that there are people waiting to politicize you doing your job and being caring and being empathetic to people in need. It just is stunning and also just um, inspiring to think that there are people who, despite knowing this, continue to do the right thing. And that's what gives me hope. Exactly. And while I'm terrified by Jasmine's experience, I'm also inspired by her and others. Because despite all these hurdles, no abortion experience at school, no clinics for hundreds of miles, she still found a way. All of my abortion training that I got in medical school happened outside of my medical school. When I got to my medical school in my first year, we realized that there wasn't a pro-choice organization. The main organization in the U.S. is Medical Students for Choice. It's a great big national organization. We didn't have a chapter at my school at that point. There had been one maybe half a decade before, but then it had kind of dissolved. And we had an anti-choice group on campus that was very, very active and had very frequent events. So Jasmine helped start a new chapter of Medical Students for Choice. And as a result, the organization sent her to an abortion training institute in Philadelphia. Because I came from a hostile background is what they named um, my school. So we got sent up here. And that weekend was the first weekend that I ever met an abortion provider. I met probably half a dozen or a dozen abortion providers up here. And that was the first time that I really got introduced to what abortion care looks like and how abortion fits into healthcare because I'd never seen it in a healthcare setting before that point. I went with one of my good friends and I left that training and we were on the flight and I was like, I think I really, really, really liked that training. And I really think that I would want to do abortions like full time. And she's 
she was like, I think you should do it. Like you would be great at it. It seems like it's like a mixture of everything you care about and are passionate about. But I was just like, I don't know if I can like admit that to other people. Like, how am I going to tell my parents about that? How am I going to move forward in my conservative medical school in this conservative area in a time where abortion is very stigmatized and very politicized. Along with the training in Philadelphia, Jasmine was also able to observe an abortion provider in a clinical setting back in Texas. I went to a city 300 miles away from my uh, school and I spent two weeks working with an abortion provider with her every day for Christmas, New Year's, um, seeing how she worked on a five-day abortion (laughs) schedule. What was she like? Um, I think that for anybody to provide abortions in a state like Texas, you have to be an amazing angel. And she was that. And one of the greatest clinicians I've ever met, like you walk into every room and each room is completely different. Like some rooms are very calm. Some are very celebratory. Some are very solemn and having a hard time with their, their decision. And she was able to switch between every single room and handle everything that she faced so well and then compose herself and do it again and do it like 30 times in one day. And I left that two-week observership taking so much more from her practice into like my general practice because abortion providers are so good at the people part of medicine that I learned so much about my communication skills from her that helped me for the second half of my year that I was finishing out. And then what was it like to go back to school after that observership? One of the things that happened to me a lot in those two weeks was I ran into patients who had driven the 300 miles as well from my same home city overnight to get there in the morning for their procedure and then spend the whole day there and then drive back. So I spent a lot of time with those patients who had done the same journey as me, but for a a lot more pressing of needs. And going back was realizing that I was going back to a community of several hundred thousand people who were without the necessary care that I had just spent two weeks helping out with. So earlier this year, Jasmine was finishing up med school. That meant it was time to apply for residency programs. Jasmine, as you might remember, loves Texas. So initially, she applied to OBGYN programs in Texas. She had no plans on leaving. And when we were talking about abortions in my interviews, it's something that I couldn't avoid talking about because it's my entire CV, but also... I was interviewing at a time when abortions were greatly, greatly, greatly controlled in Texas because of SB8. So we had our six week ban already in effect. And of course, it's something that they talked about. They're like, well, you can't get your training here. And so I made a pact to myself that I wasn't going to let myself not get that training. And so that's why I came up to New Jersey, where New Jersey in January passed a law to protect abortions up to 25 weeks without federal protection which is even further than we had protected in Texas before SV-8, which is an amazing thing. Think about that for a moment. Jasmine had to literally go across the country to get the training she needed. This is just so indicative of where we are right now and how we're living in a country that is very fractured. And literally divided, you know, not the sort of divided and the divisive civility rhetoric, but no, no, divided literally into places where you can get human rights access to healthcare and places where you can't. I honestly felt a relief when I moved out of Texas. And that's a terrible thing to say because I love Texas. I dearly love Texas. And I feel for all the people who are still living there and can never leave and are disenfranchised. I would absolutely love to go back to Texas and treat Texas patients because I know that for people outside of Texas, it doesn't seem like it's a great place to live, but I lived there for 27 years and I loved it. And I would love to go back and do abortions there full time should it be legal when I'm done. I 
I just think about that quote, the Marion Wright Edelman quote that we hear a lot about how you can't be what you can't see. And thinking about, you know, what would it be like for people to learn younger as they plan their careers to know I could be a provider, I could be helping people feel empowered to make important decisions about their lives and help people feel supported in a really important and profound moment in their life. <laughs> Doctors are just nerdy people at the end of the day who went to a lot of school. You know, they they should they, they shouldn't have to also take on this entire political identity and have to fight, you know, choosing their specialty should not be a political choice. You know, people who specialize in neurosurgery or people who specialize in dermatology or people who specialize in you know all the different things that you can specialize in, choosing dermatology is not a political choice. You don't have to think about getting a bulletproof vest in order to provide care. And, and these doctors do. They have to think about that. They have to think about their physical safety. They have to think about their families and their future families. They also have to think about where they can live. Like Jasmine, I can't, if I choose this specialty, I can't live in the state where I'm from. I can't be a part of my own community. I can't thrive. I can't live down the block from my parents. I can't, all these different things. And so choosing this, choosing abortion care is just really takes in this environment a next level person who's so committed to care, who's so committed to human rights on an autonomy that they'll take on a really heavy burden. And I and I I wish it didn't have to be like that. I wish it could they could just be like any other nerd <laughs> and choose based on the science, choose based on whatever compels them about the care and the procedure and not have to think about all this other stuff. We're going to take a series break, and we'll be back on August 3rd with another set of stories. In the meantime, keep learning about abortion pills, keep donating to clinics and abortion funds, and keep vigilant in the streets. We'll talk to you soon. Ordinary Equality is a Wonder Media Network production. This episode was produced by Maddie Foley and Sarah Schleed. Our editor is Lindsay Craddowill. Our executive producer is Jenny Kaplan. Big thanks to our sponsor, Act Blue.